Yeah, so what I want to do today is the take, talk about making peace with nature. And so I'll bring in the issues that you're going to be talking about all day. Climate change, <coughs> climate change, loss of biodiversity, and <laughs> the screen seems to be going smaller at the moment, not bigger. Uh, well, I'll carry on anyway. Um, so, perfect, perfect. Next slide, please. First, I want to spend just a few minutes talking about the interface between science and policy. As I think, I think we all know that scientific evidence is a necessary but not sufficient condition for informed evidence-based policy formulation and implementation. There are many factors that go into making a decision, but it is a minimum requirement that we have good, solid scientific evidence on issues like climate change and loss of biodiversity, land degradation, pollution. We need to respond in these assessments to the needs of society, not just governments, but all decision makers. And so assessments need to be demand driven, not supply driven by the scientific community. They need to be credible, transparent, legitimate, and the results need to be owned by all relevant decision makers. Therefore, it's essential to have well-defined principles and procedures so the assessments can't be attacked, whether they're national assessments or international assessments. Clearly, one needs to develop a consensus view of what we know, what we don't know, what's robust and what's uncertain. Clearly, one has to talk about uncertainty, critical for politicians and others to understand what effectively uncertainty means for policy uh, formulation. We need to address uh, social issues, environmental issues and economic issues and say what the implications are for both action and inaction. And we, while we all recognise that technologies and policies are necessary, so is behaviour change. But at the individual level, the uh, role of governments, the role of the private sector. The next slide, continue on, the, on this theme. Next slide, please. And clearly these assessments, especially if they are global assessments, they need to be uh, prepared by the world's best recognized experts. We need balanced intellectual uh, input, natural science, social science, humanities, technologies, law, business. We need geographic balance from all over the world. We need gender balance. But the individuals, they're involved in an individual capacity and they are nominated and chosen through open and transparent processes. We need the assessments to be multi-thematic, multi-spatial, multi-temporal. We typically look back 50 to 100 years and typically look forward at 50 to 100 years. Uh, we need to link environmental issues to development issues and the policy processes. In particular, we need to link it to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. It's important the assessments are evidence-based, not ideological. And some of the issues that we deal with, like genetic modification, international trade, organic agriculture, can quite often as some of the experts try and mix ideological views rather than just evidence-based views. We have to recognize in the world, there are diverse world views and value systems. The value systems often of someone from the UK or the US might be very different from someone from an indigenous and local tribe. And therefore we need to use both traditional knowledge and institutional knowledge as appropriate. The next slide, please. <coughs> next slide. Yeah, there are many uh, international assessments. Ah, oh, back one. Well, there are many international assessments from uh, stratospheric ozone depletion, climate change, uh, biodiversity loss, etc. What this slide shows you is effectively stratospheric ozone. On the top in purple is some of the uh, advances in science that we made from 1970s till recently. So the hypothesis of stratospheric ozone depletion, 1974, we saw the Antarctic ozone loss around 1985, 
we saw mid-latitude ozone loss by 1988. And in that period of the mid-1980s, we actually demonstrated through really good science, laboratory science, field measurements, theoretical studies, that these losses of ozone were due to human activity. The yellow shows you a sequence of international assessments. First one was in 1981, which I co-chaired, then 1985, all the way through to actually the present day. I chaired or co-chaired them all the way up to 2014. The next slide, that's uh, not the next slide, sorry. The next level shows you what happened basically on policy. 1985, we saw the Vienna Convention. 1987, the Montreal Protocol. And since then, there have been a whole series of amendments and adjustments. And through the policy, long live that chlorine and bromine species were banned, and then short lived chlorine and bromine species were banned. And at the very bottom in red, you can see how, what happened to the atmospheric loading of chlorine. This is probably the most successful of all of the science policy integrated. Good research by academics, leading to good international assessments, close coordination between science and policy, and effectively, the ozone layer will recover in the mid-century. Next slide. So what we have to recognize is we have all of these issues, climate change, loss of biodiversity, stratospheric ozone, chemicals, land degradation, pollution, air, water, pollution. All of these issues are interconnected. And therefore, UNET commissioned a small group of scientists, and I co-led this with Eva Basti uh, from Norway. And so we came up with this document, Making Peace with Nature, uh, a scientific blueprint to tackle the climate, biodiversity, and pollution emergencies. Uh, next slide. Uh, next slide, this just is that uh, introduces it. Next slide, please. Fine. So, can you go back one? If you can't, it doesn't matter. Yeah, fine. So, what we did, small group of scientists, about 50 of us, 25 of that have tried to prepare the document, and 25 were on an advisory committee. Nearly everybody that was involved in this had already been involved in either IPCC, IPBES, GEO, the International Resource Panel, or one of the others. The OVAL document is therefore based on a work of thousands of experts from all over the world. And in nearly all of these assessments, governments have been involved in approving the summaries. What we concluded, no surprise, the environmental challenges have grown considerably since the Stockholm Conference in 1972. Next slide. What we've realized is that we humans have transformed our relationship with nature. In the last 50 years, trade has grown tenfold. The global economy has grown fivefold and the world population has doubled. This means we've got far more demand for resources, food, water, energy, fiber. And this economic model has indeed improved the average prosperity around the world. There are less people that are hungry. There are less people that are poor. But there are still 1.3 billion people that are poor. And there are still 700 million people that are hungry. And therefore, this economic model that we've used is an unequal model, basically, and also a model that's degrading uh, the Earth's environment. And we're starting to su surpass the Earth's finite capacity to sustain human well being. Therefore, in the coming decades, and this decade is absolutely critical, we need to transform our relationship with nature. And that's what the rest of the talk is about. Next slide, please. This actually shows you how the biomass on Earth has changed dramatically. Humans now are about one third of all the biomass of mammals on Earth. Our livestock is nearly two thirds of the biomass of mammals on Earth. And the wild, uh, the wild mammals are literally you know, only 
or less. The next slide shows us basically how we've uh, demanded energy. Slide goes all the way back to the 1800s. But the key period to look at is the last 50 years from 1960 onwards. And effectively, we have tripled our demand for energy in the last 50 years. And this indeed is predominantly fossil fuel energy, coal, oil and natural gas, small amounts of hydropower, nuclear, renewable energy. And it, indeed, it's this use of fossil fuels that is leading to about 75% of greenhouse gas emissions, predominantly, of course, uh, carbon dioxide, but also methane as well. The next slide shows how we've actually changed our land. We have literally transformed our land. We humans have impacted at least three quarters of the Earth's land surface that's ice free. We've transformed much of the oceans. Indeed, one quarter of the land has been radically transformed. And on the right hand side, you can see how the land is currently used from agriculture to forestry, etc. And what we project is that effectively by 2050, the next 30 years, only 10% of the land will not have been transformed by human activity. These land use practices have resulted in about one quarter of the greenhouse gas emissions, uh, some night carbon dioxide from deforestation, methane and nitrous oxide from agricultural practices. The next slide then talks about what happens about chemicals. And if you look effectively at the purple line, the global production of chemicals, predominantly from emerging economies, has grown significantly in the last 20 or 30, in the last 20 years. If you look at the other two lines, the blue and the red line, that's our use of pesticides and fertilizers. It certainly increased agricultural productivity, but many of these chemicals just get flow from the land into our rivers, into our lakes, and into our coastal zones, and really have adversely affected uh, aquatic biodiversity. In fact, we have about 400 dead zones in the coastal regions around the world, roughly the area of the United Kingdom. The next slide, please then talks about greenhouse gas emissions. I've really already discussed this in light blue. We see the changes in the last uh, 30 years of fossil fuel CO2, but you can see the contribution from methane, nitrous oxide, fluorinated gases, land use changes CO2, as well as then methane and nitrous oxide right at the top. These changes in carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases have shown that the world has already warmed by more than one, one degree Celsius in the last century. In fact, the recent IPCC report that came out a few weeks ago says we've already warmed the world about 1.2 degrees Celsius. We're seeing sea level rise accelerating. We're seeing more frequent intense extreme events, floods, droughts, uh, the intensity of hurricanes and cyclones seems to be increasing. And all of these changes to our environment are threatening people and nature. The next slide then talks about biodiversity. What are the direct drivers of biodiversity? Well, there's five mainly. Land and sea use change, direct exploitation, climate change, invasive alien species and pollution. And in terrestrial and uh, fresh water systems, the main drivers are sea and land use change, followed by direct exploitation, followed by climate change, pollution, invasive aliens. So slightly different, but not much in marine ecosystems. The major driver there for the loss of biodiversity has been direct exploitation, basically overfishing. We now estimate that one million of the estimated 8 million plants and animal species are threatened with extinction. These can, most of these can be saved if we start to conserve and restore biodiversity. If we eliminate climate change or minimize climate change, eliminate pollution, etc. 
We've also noted that the size and abundance of species are dropping. Our ecosystems are being degraded and especially our regulating ecosystem services and our cultural ecosystem services are eroding. We're seeing uh, services such as climate protection, pest, uh, pest regulation, all degrading significantly. And while climate change, as you can see from this slide, is not the, has not been the dominant uh, driver of biodiversity loss, if we do not meet the Paris targets or get to grips with climate change, climate change could well be the dominant driver of the loss of biodiversity in the coming decades. And so include, clearly, we cannot deal with climate change without dealing with biodiversity loss and vice versa. Next slide, please. This simply shows, says we need to think about what could be plausible futures. Uh, four or uh, several plausible futures have been looked at. Uh, SSP1 is a more sustainable world. It's about one where you have effective international cooperation. You have uh, low growth in the consumption of materials. We move more. We move more to a low meat diet. We reduce the inequality around the world. We have relatively low population growth, uh, but we do have good economic growth, and that's a more sustainable world. The other three worlds are far less sustainable, with the least sustainable being SFP3. So we can look at all of these worlds, ask ourselves the question, what could happen to the climate in the future? What could happen to biodiversity in the future? The next slide, please. Then to next slide. Uh, this is an old slide, but well, that was an old slide, basically. Uh, but what it shows you is a low emission scenario relative to a high emission scenario. You have far less change of climate, uh, temperature or precipitation. The land areas warm more than the oceans and the high latitudes warm more than the equatorial region. We also see that precipitation tends to increase in the equatorial belt and at high latitudes, but decrease in the, uh, in the mid latitudes. This slide shows you sea level rise. Again, it's an old slide, but it's basically consistent with what came out with IPCC only a few weeks ago. And that is there's a range of our sea level rise projections, depending on the emissions from the low emissions, the 2.6 scenario, to the high emissions, 8.5. The reason for sea level rise is thermal expansion of the ocean, melting of mountain glaciers, and we can model that really well. The big uncertainty is what will happen to the Greenland ice sheet and what will happen to the Antarctic ice sheet, especially the West Antarctic ice sheet. And there's some significant uncertainties of what could happen in the next few uh, decades and in fact, the IPC shows in a, in a really uh, adverse situation, one could get much more than a one meter sea level rise if indeed we get disintegration or partial disintegration of the Greenland ice sheet and we start to see major changes in the West Antarctic ice sheet. Next slide. These are just some of the projected impacts the chart climate change we have to care about. We have to worry about water availability and water quality in arid and semi-arid regions. We have to worry about agricultural uh, productivity going down, especially in the tropics and subtropics. We're concerned about an increase in vector-borne and waterborne disease, increase in heat stress mortality, a decrease in nutrition, especially from agriculture in developing countries, and an increase in extreme weather events such as uh, floods and droughts. We clearly, and I'll talk about it later, have to worry about the impact on e ecosystems and biodiversity, and we have to worry about sea level rise. Now, in the oceans, there's three issues we have to care about. Warm ocean temperatures, sea level rise, ocean acidification, all having an effect on biodiversity. Next slide, please. This actually shows you, uh, this comes from IPCC, of course, it's the burning embers diagrams. 
there are effectively four histograms in each of these uh, blocks. They go from the TAR, the third assessment report, to the SR 1.5 report that came out about two years ago now. And these are five different threats from climate change, unique and threatened species, what are the impacts of extreme weather events, How the, what are the distributional effects, what are the aggregated effects, and what are the potential large-scale discontinuities, like loss of permafrost, changes in ocean circulation, loss of the Greenland ice sheet. The bottom, each of them have got two sets of dotted lines. The bottom line is where you have the transition from undetectable change to a moderate threat from that climate. The upper line is a transition from a moderate threat to a high threat. What you can actually see in every one of them, especially on large scale discontinuities and aggregated impacts, the transition from undetectable to moderate and moderate to high is occurring now with new scientific evidence at a much lower, much smaller temperature change than we thought even in 2002 uh, when I shared the third assessment report. So in other words, climate change is a much bigger threat than we thought only 20 years ago. The next slide then talks about, uh, I've already done this next slide, it's a duplicate slide, apologize. This shows you some of the risks uh, to terrestrial ecosystems. The risks go from uh, what will happen to water scarcity in dry lands, soil, uh, soil erosion, vegetation loss, all the way to sort of tropical crop decline. And what you can see here is literally the amber, the moderate risk occurs between one and two degrees Celsius and the high risk and very high risk starts to come around two degrees Celsius. So our terrestrial systems are extremely vulnerable to one, two, three degrees temperature increase. The next slide. Next slide. There's a, yeah, that's fine, that can stay with us. So one of the key issues is biodiversity. One looked at three scenarios, basically, and uh, yellow, green, and orange. And the orange is our sustainability scenario. And what you can see here, even with a sustainability scenario, we still see significant local loss of species between now and 2050, loss of regional species richness between now and 2050, and biodiversity intactness. There's no question the sustainability scenario is better than the other scenario, but all of our scenarios that we did in the global biodiversity assessment of it best all show significant projected loss of biodiversity over the next uh, 30 years. The next slide. This shows you effectively what will happen to the individual species, insects, birds, mammals, and plants. What will happen? When will they lose 50% of their climatically determined geographic range? So you can say for insects, for example, with a 1.5 degree change, about 5% loss. At two degrees, 18% loss. At 3.2 degrees, almost 50% loss. And at four and a half degrees Celsius, about 68% loss. Similarly, we can see for birds, mammals, and plants, as you go from a projected change of 1.5 to 4.5 degrees Celsius, significant adverse effects on all of these species at higher temperatures. Even 1.5 degrees Celsius is actually bad for biodiversity. Next slide. This shows you similar to what we saw for the terrestrial system. This shows you what happens to oceanic systems. On average, they're a little bit less sensitive, with the exception of coral reefs. With a 1.5 degree change, 70 to 90% of warm water coral reefs are projected to decline. And at 2 degrees Celsius, greater than 99% of warm water corals are projected to decline. In other words, 
our culinary systems around the world clearly will no longer exist in a warmer world. Next slide, please. This simply talks a little bit about ocean ecosystems. It talks about maximum fisheries and production, it talks about animal biomass and net primary production. RCP 2.6 is low emission, RCP 8.5 high emission. And what you can see, especially at high emissions, but equally an effect at low emissions, you can see major reductions in fish catch all over the world, except at very high latitudes in the Northern Hemisphere. Equally see major changes in animal biomass and major changes in primary productivity. The next slide. This actually says that for a given temperature change, it matters what type of development pathway you're on. So as I said earlier, SSP1 is a more sustainable world. Uh, good, econo good economic growth, low population, people working together. SSP3 is a very divergent world. People don't work together. They li literally look for national security. There's no cooperation in the world. And what you can see uh, for desertification, land degradation, food insecurity, then if we do at least have a sustainable development pathway, the effects of temperature are less than we on an unsustainable pathway. Next slide, please. This is how well did we do on trying to preserve biodiversity in the last uh, uh, 10 years. Uh, there was a meeting in Japan in 2010. They came up with 20 biodiversity targets. They were looking at the drivers of biodiversity, the pressures on biodiversity, the status of biodiversity, the benefits from biodiversity, and how we implement our policies and actions. IPCC Invest Global Assessment looked at this, and so did Global Biodiversity Outlook 5. Well, how well did we do? Well, the answer is we met none of the IT targets fully. Um, each target has, a, has some sub-targets in it. If you see a colour blue, it means we exceeded the uh, target. I think you can see probably about one blue on there. There might be two. Green means we made relatively good progress. You can see a couple of slides of uh, blue, green, Ye yellow, moderate progress, but we got nowhere close to the Aichi target. Red was where we made poor or no progress, and purple where we went backwards. You can see we did a pretty miserable job. We have some progress, but to be quite honest, very modest progress in trying to address the challenge of restricting the loss of biodiversity and the degradation of ecosystems. Next slide. This fundamentally is the wedding cake slide. On the bottom is our natural resource base, climate change and biodiversity. And what this really says is if we don't get to grips and address the issues of climate change and biodiversity, we're not going to be able to, we're not going to be able to deal with the production and consumption. They will undermine our efforts to make our cities more sustainable. They will undermine our ability to have food and water security. And in turn, this will impede any progress we want to make on poverty alleviation, reducing inequality around the world, uh, having good human health for all. But fundamentally, dealing with climate change and biodiversity is essential if we want to look at all of the other UN Sustainable Development Goals. In other words, climate change and biodiversity are not just environmental issues, they're development issues, they're economic issues, they're security issues, moral issues, and ethical issues. Next slide. So, what do we need to do? Well, we clearly need to transform our relationship with nature. There's no question our knowledge, our ingenuity, our technology and cooperation can transform societies and the economy and could secure a sustainable future. It will require a fundamental change 
technologically, economically, socially, and our organization of society. We need to reconsider our worldviews, our norms, our values, and our governance system. We will need major shifts in investment and regulations if we want a just and uh, informed transformation. We will need to overcome inertia and opposition from vested interests. There are many around the world that actually like the status quo. They like unsustainable subsidies. They like uh, cheap fossil fuels. They like degrading nature. They're making a profit from it. Clearly, the obvious message is we have to look at all of these emergencies to together. The next slide very simply shows. Next slide. It simply shows that. Ah, ah, what it shows, you don't have to go back. Climate change is affected by loss of biodiversity and land degradation. Land degradation is affected by climate change and loss of biodiversity. And biodiversity is affected uh, by climate change and land degradation. And all of them affect human well being. So if we look at the Paris Agreement, what are the key measures? Keep global temperature increase below two degrees Celsius and try and keep it to 1.5. This says that global emissions should peak as soon as possible, preferably by now, 2020, 2021. And we need to adapt and we need to provide developing countries with financial resources so they can also mitigate and adapt to climate change. The next slide is a key it is a key slide. Uh, this shows you that if you want to be on a pathway to 1.5 degrees Celsius, you need to reduce emissions almost immediately. And if you don't deal with emissions immediately, then by the middle of the century, we will need to have negative emissions, something that I think is highly implausible on a scale that this would show. So the message here is, to be on a 1.5 pathway, immediate emission reductions. The next slide actually shows you, if you want to be on a 1.5 pathway, we need to reduce our emissions by 45, 50% by 2030 relative to 2010 and be net zero by 2050. And even that only gives us a 50% chance of reaching that target. To make a two degree target, we need to decline emissions 25% by 2030, reach net zero around 2070. What this slide shows you, if you look at all of the details you can ignore, with all of the current pledges under the Paris Agreement, the emissions in 2030 will be the same as they are today. They won't be 20% less or 45% less, they will be comparable today with the current pledges, as some countries are not even meeting their current pledges. Therefore, we're on a pathway to three to four degrees Celsius. We're not on a pathway to 1.5 or two. The next slide. The Paris Agreement is a good agreement, but the current pledges are totally inadequate. We're likely to reach 1.5 degrees Celsius in the mid 2030s, and we're likely to pass the two degree target around 2050, 2060, unless we have significantly strengthened pledges. And that's why the meeting in Glasgow in a couple of months' time is so crucial. Next slide. If we want to deal with biodiversity, we need simultaneous action. We need to conserve what we have. We need to restore. We need to address climate change, absolutely critical. We need to address over-exploitation, land and sea use. We need to address pollution, address invasive species. We need sustainable production, and we need reduced consumption. And therefore, we need all of these things simultaneously. It's not a choice of one or other, it's all of them. The next slide. So what do we need? We need a major transformation 
in economic and financial and productive systems. If we have it, we can shift to a more sustainable world. We need to include natural capital in our decision making. We need natural capital to be included in inclusive wealth. That is, inclusive wealth is the combination of natural capital, human capital, and produced capital. It's a much better measure of whether economic development is sustainable rather than gross domestic product. So we need to use inclusive wealth in our decision making. We need to eliminate harmful fossil fuel subsidies, mining subsidies, transportation subsidies, and feeding subsidies. We need to embrace a circular economy. We need to internalize externalities in the price of our goods and services. And we need to then invest in the transition to a sustainable future. We need to ramp up financing for biodiversity and climate. And we can do that by right redirecting some of these direct and indirect subsidies away from fossil fuels towards a low carbon economy and conservation and restoration of biodiversity. The next slide says that we need, clearly need to look at the food, water and energy system in a much more integrated way. If you think of agriculture, you can't think about it without thinking about water or about energy. And therefore, these three systems must be managed together. We must not manage them separately like we do today. The next slide talks about the top types of things we should do for sustainable agriculture. What will it require? Well, we do need to increase our productivity if we're going to effectively uh, feed the world. We need an agricultural system that works with nature. We need to be able to adapt to a changing climate. We need to reduce the footprint of agriculture on the environment. And we need to, of course, use our agricultural system to eliminate hunger and contribute in a positive way to human health. And therefore, well, we need to reduce our income. We need to reduce the use of agricultural chemicals. We need to increase water use efficiency. Uh, we need organic farming, we need agroecology, integrated pest and nutrient management, soil water conservation, etc. We need healthy diets, we need to reduce food waste, we need to reduce ag perverse agricultural subsidies. Equally, when we look at fresh water system, we need to really think about how can we manage our fresh water systems. We need to recognise we need cross-sectoral management. We need to think about agriculture, industry and household, the uses and the needs together. So clear, and we need to clearly have appropriate water policies, including appropriate pricing. The next slide uh, talks about a key issue of today, zoonotic diseases. 75% of all infectious diseases have their origin in animals. There are 700,000 potential viruses in animals and birds that could pose a threat to human well-being. And therefore, what do we need to do? Well, we need to try and prevent a future pandemic and we need to manage future pandemics much better than we've had managed this current pandemic. Well, we need to reduce deforestation. We need to limit the human-wildlife interaction. We need to limit the livestock wild animal interaction, because our livestock uh, can be a carrier between wild stock, wild animals and ourselves. And we need much more hygienic wet markets. We can limit pandemics, but we really have to think about it carefully and we will need much better international cooperation. The next slide I've just about finished, so you'll be pleased to hear. Everybody has a role to play. This is not just an issue for governments. We need governments, we need international organizations, the finance world, banks, pension funds, all have a key role to play. NGOs a key role, the private sector, individuals, and the scientific community. And the next two slides just pick just a couple of issues. Next slide, please, of what people can do. So governments include natural capital in a measure of economic performance. 
get rid of our harmful subsidies, shift to a low carbon economy, internalize those externalities, international organizations, promote a one health agenda, basically, uh, set international targets for mitigating climate change, help to conserve biodiversity, improve uh, protected area networks, financial organizations, obviously, stop lending for fossil fuels and develop new instruments, financial instruments, for conservation of biodiversity and for sustainable agriculture. And the last slide with any substance on it is effectively that, in, that businesses have a role, governments have a role, we individuals, we, re need, we need to reconsider our relationship with nature. We need to change our habits. We need to cut food, water, energy waste. And we need to think what would be a healthier diet. I am not arguing we need to become vegans or vegetarians, but we probably need a more balanced diet, more vegetables, more fruits, and less at meat, but a balanced diet. And of course, scientific organizations have a key role to play in producing the knowledge that is needed for evidence-based our policy formulation, pioneer new technologies. And so the last slide simply shows you uh, what the website is. Uh, thank you very much. So the bottom line is we clearly are destroying our world, but we can transform our world. We must consider <coughs> climate change, biodiversity, land degradation and pollution as one integrated issue. We've got to stop thinking about these as just environmental issues, but also development issues, economic, social, security, moral and ethical issues, as I said earlier. Thank you.